Hey, hey, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Let's take a look at fiscal and monetary policy and its effect on aggregate demand. Look at fiscal and monetary policy. You know, I've talked about m macroeconomic concept. You need to think about the government as the parent of a country. And the gov but the governments only have two tools in their toolbox. And actually, in my classroom, I have a toolbox. And in there are two tools. One is the fiscal policy and the other is monetary policy. And those are the only tools that the government has to affect um, the economy. It's, it's, it's amazing. There are so many different things they can do, but they all fall into a, two very distinct categories of fiscal policy, which has to do with the government's um, set of rules on spending and taxing. Okay, so that's taxing and spending. And then monetary policy is a set of official rules that have to do with the money supply and the level of interest rates in the economy. Fiscal policy, taxing, spending. Monetary policy, the money supply, and interest rates. And interest rates are basically, in a really clear way, the price of borrowing money. And of course, the government is who issues money, so they are the ones who are able to decide the price of borrowing it. Okay. Have those very clear in your mind. Fiscal and monetary policy, the two tools the government has in order to parent the economy. All right, let's look at each one more specifically. Fiscal policy and aggregate demand. So with this video, we're going to take a look at fiscal policy and how it affects aggregate demand. And one of the biggest challenges you have as an IB student is to wade your way through all of the ways in which fiscal and monetary policy affect the economy. Fiscal and monetary policy are huge concepts in macroeconomics because the government's the one who's going to be asked to get involved here. And these are the tools that they have. So this is going to come up in aggregate demand. This is going to come up in aggregate supply. This is going to affect um, inflation rates. This could even affect employment. This could affect the distribution and the, uh, and the equity of income. These are the two things the government uses in order to manipulate the economy. Okay, so fiscal policy is defined as the set of a government's policies relating to its spending and taxation rates. Direct taxes and indirect taxes can be raised or lowered to alter the amount of disposable income consumers have. So check it out. If you if the if if let's say the government wants to decrease aggregate demand, and if you haven't seen the business cycle video, you need to check it out because as aggregate demand goes up, What's going to happen is there's going to be inflationary pressure, which means that there's going to be a general pressure for the prices of things to go up because demand is going up. And as demand goes up, so do prices. So the government might want to contract. They might want to slow the economy down. Whoa, 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 whoa. And the way they could do that is to increase either direct taxes or indirect taxes so that people have less income. And it sounds kind of cruel. And in the main, in the, maybe in the short run, and certainly some philosophers, like philosophical opinions will say that that's bad. But basically, you're taking away people's disposable income. If I make 100 bucks a year and you tax me at 25%, I got $75 left. But if you increase that tax rate to 30%, whoa, you know, now I only have 70 and you've cut my, my ability to spend, my, my, my disposable income, by 5%. That's a lot. Okay. The other thing is expansionary fiscal policy, which is the opposite, right? It's to increase aggregate demand. So if you cut indirect taxes or you cut direct taxes on income or taxes on, it, on, on goods at a per unit level, that means that people are going to have more money, right? More money to spend on things. Just like if you had my tax rates 30% and I got 70 bucks in my pocket after I make 100, you change it to only tax me 10%, you cut income taxes by 10%. Whoa, that's like getting a free 10% of income. It's like getting a 10% raise almost, okay? And that matters a lot. And that will lead to expanding the economy because people tend to spend money if they have it. So an expansionary fiscal policy, if the government would like to encourage greater consumption, then it can lower income taxes to increase disposable income, and this will likely increase aggregate demand. If a government would like to increase, encourage greater investment, then it can lower corporate taxes because co corporations, firms get taxed just like uh, individuals do. So firms enjoy after-tax profits 
that can be used for investment, and this is likely to increase aggregate demand. If companies are investing in building stores, and I always use the Walmart example, if Walmart builds another store, that's another 100 jobs. If you got another 100 jobs, that means there's 100 people making more money than they are making before, and then they're going to spend it, probably at Walmart, right? But that would increase aggregate demand. And then lastly, governments have a major – governments could also do expansionary policy by just spending themselves – spending the money themselves. Governments have major investment projects and may increase their spending in order to improve or increase public services. And the great example from the 2008 recession in the United States was the Obama administration in, released $3 billion that was locked up in Congress in order to fix the interstate highway system in the United States. That's $3 billion – more of aggregate demand, because, of course, government, the G component of aggregate demand, right? If that goes up by $3 billion, that, first of all, that's just a bunch of money going into the economy. But that's going to create a lot of jobs, which is going to even multiply the effect of that $3 billion even more. And it's going to push aggregate demand outward. OK, so that's fiscal policy, right? The spending and taxing portion tool of, the, of, of a government. The other tool is monetary policy, and that's defined, monetary policy is defined as the set of official policies governing the supply of money in the economy and the level of interest rates in the economy. Now, the supply of money is not really dealt with too directly in the IB syllabus. Um, th there's some, there's some uh, pretty complicated ways that the Federal Reserve, the banking system in the United States or in any country, the central bank of any com country, can manipulate the actual money supply. And I'm not talking about printing more bills or you know, burning bills. No, I'm talking about ways in which they can buy. They, what they do is they sell bonds and they sell bonds into the market and then they keep the cash. And so as you sell a $100 bond, a person gets a piece of paper. They can't go spend at Walmart. But the government gets the 100 bucks, And what do they do with it? They sit on it. They don't do anything on it, right? And they contract the money supply by doing that. Okay, so that's one thing. But the main focus of the IB curriculum is interest rates. And interest rates is the price of money. Now, anytime the price of anything goes up, demand will go down. And anytime the price goes down, demand will go up. So interest rates can affect the level of aggregate demand. And it's pretty logical. If you just think of money as like a commodity, just like something that you need, right? Like you need, I don't know, bread in your house. Everybody's got some bread in their house. Well, if the price of bread goes up, you're going to buy less of it. So you're going to have less bread. If the price goes down, you're going to have more bread, maybe, at least in the short run. So interest rates are just how much it costs for you to go into a bank and say, hey, man, I want to buy a house. What's it going to cost me? And they say, oh, it's going to cost you 4% of the $100,000 that you need to borrow to buy the house. Well, that's a lot better than going into the bank and saying, hey, man, how much is the bank? How much is a loan? And they say, oh, it's going to cost you 10%. It's like, whoa, right? 10%, that's $10,000 on $100,000. 4% is only four. That's $6,000. That's a massive change. So what's going to happen? Well... If interest rates are lower, aggregate demand is going to go out because money will be cheaper, which is to say flowing more freely. I would not take a bank loan to buy a house at 10%. I would take it at 4%. There you go. There's a perfect example. Okay? So, the cent so that's that. But the central bank interest rates affect borrowing at all levels of the banking system. And this gets a bit complicated, and you get more into it when you get into um, – uh, inflation and how it, they manage the, the, the flow of money. But the central bank is the, set, is the government's bank, and they lend money to commercial banks, right? And the commercial banks then take that money and, send, and, 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 and loan it again. So if a central bank has to pay 1% to get money, I'm sorry, if a commercial bank has to get 1%, has to pay 1% to get money from the government, then they're going to charge, say, 2% to a citizen, but if the interest rate were half a percent, well, they're going to go get more money at half a percent, the commercial bank is. And then they'll be able to sell that money to people at a lesser rate, like, say, 1.5%. Hey, a 1.5% loan is great. So the, the, the rate is called the base rate. The change in the central bank's base rate can affect the level of aggregate demand in an economy because it's ultimately what banks have to pay in order to borrow money from the government. And banks, commercial banks, Bank of America, Citibank, Scotia Bank, Banco de Chile, all of the international banks that are out there, Wells Fargo, they all borrow money on a daily basis from the federal government. Well, if the base rate is super low, 
then they're going to turn around and sell money to people really low, and that's going to stimulate the economy. But if they increase the base rate, then all of a sudden money becomes more expensive, and then less people are going to spend money, and that's a way of, of contracting the economy. So examples to increase aggregate demand, the central bank might alter the base rate. Okay. So in other words, if the base rate goes down, that means interest rates are cheaper, then aggregate demand is going to go up, and that would be expansionary or loose monetary policy. If the base rate goes up, aggregate demand is going to go down because money got more expensive, right? Because the base rate is higher, money is more expensive. And that's a contractu contractionary or tight monetary policy. And different governments, based on their political ideologies and the needs of the economy at a time, manipulate that interest rate to control spending. And it has a massive impact on spending in a country. And as a result, the federal government or the national government of any country, I'm saying federal government because I'm thinking of the United States, but the national government of any country can really manipulate and control the expansion or contraction of its own economy. Okay. Good deal. Monetary and fiscal policy, they're littered throughout the, the macroeconomic curriculum. Make sure you got it clear in your head. It's going to get super confusing. But listen, you just if you're confused, just go back and do it again. You'll be surprised. On the third pass, it's going to click, and you're going to have it in your mind forever. Am I right? That's what makes econ so exciting is that it's in the world and in the news, and especially macroeconomics is in the news all of the time, daily. And you're going to have a greater understanding of it through your studies. All right. I hope you found this video helpful. We'll talk to you in a bit.